New York City, August. It's hot, muggy, and most of all, stinky. But here, in the home of one of the world's greatest fragrance houses, it is cool, dry, and most of all, it smells wonderful. Why does it smell so good? For the same reason that every product and fine fragrance you use smells good. Because master perfumers, scent evaluators, scientists, regulators, and hundreds of thousands of support staff are hard at work developing aromas that tickle our olfactory scents, create everlasting memories, and enhance our lives in ways we never realize. Consumers probably don't even realize how much of an inner change they have with fragrances on a regular basis. When I first came into this industry some 35 years ago, I didn't know how a fragrance was made, didn't really even care. You probably use fragrance 10, 12 times a day. It brings back memories. It's in every aspect from the time that you wake up to the time that you go to bed and your entire environment is, is fragrance. Most people start off their morning by, you know, taking a shower, washing their hair, and shaving with another fragrance evolved, possibly an aftershave, another fragrance evolved, antiperspirant, deodorant, another fragrance evolved, some cream lotion, another fragrance evolved. Every one of these products lend a certain level of pleasure to your day. The part of the nose that smell inside your nose is actually the only part of the brain that is in contact with the outside environment. So you actually smell with your brain directly. So people, for instance, have to know that when they smell a tomato or they smell a melon, eh, there's actually a little piece of that melon, a few molecules of that melon that are actually coming physically or going physically from that melon to the nose. People don't realize the art behind the product. Not only the result, but the effort that goes into making it and the people who are making it who dedicate their lives in an artistic way to, to bring upon those creations that make everybody feel great, that bring memories to people, that, you know, make them happy. This is the story of fragrances. Just as art cannot exist without an artist, a fragrance cannot exist without a perfumer. I'm Mark Banwer, Executive Vice President for Bell May and in charge of international fragrance development. I've been with Bell May for 36 years now and have been in the fragrance industry for 51 years. I wanted to be an architect. Went to engineering school, ran out of money, needed a job, and I wound up getting a job as a lab technician for a fragrance company some 35 years ago. Actually, my father was a pharmacist, and he prepared his own compositions in fragrance and sold them in the pharmacy in a big can, you know, the tap, where people would fill their colognes and their... So that was his passion. And in some way, it got transmitted to me. You were still an apprentice, so uh, it was a very unusual time. I worked for these two European gentlemen that were really, really uh, very old world, and uh, they, they taught me very well. My last training happened to be in flavor chemistry at uh, Procter & Gamble, and uh, the flavorist told me to go and interview with the perfumers. A very famous perfumer, Pierre Bourdon, told me from the very beginning, well, you know, Christophe, to become a perfumer, you have to be you have to learn at least for five years to start playing the piano, what we call the piano, all these ingredients that we use, the notes. And then he said it takes around 10 years to start being able to play. The first project that put me in the map was Polo by Ralph Lauren. And, and at the time I was a very young perfumer and I had no idea of the kind of success I was generating. But it was uh, an arduous, uh, work, uh, an arduous development. It took, it took at least a year, if not more, hundreds of experiments. But uh, the result was unbelievable in the sense that it affected generations of, of, of young people. When a consumer product company or fine fragrance brand puts out a call for a fragrance, Perfumers compete to find the perfect scent for the client. Sometimes I'll see a color and I start to design in my head. I, I bought a new golf shirt a couple of weeks ago and it was really, I bought it because I really loved the color and I started in my head designing a fragrance for that color. 
every time you start a new project, it's like a, a wonderment, it's like a, a, a child with a, a new toy, you know. <laughs> so you, you get all excited. You have uh, one extreme where someone comes, says, well, I would like a cent for, for me or for my brand or for my space. You have an image of what, where you want to, what you want to achieve. But from having that image to achieving it takes sometimes a year or two of work. Sometimes we just give up on a fragrance because it's just not, it's just not moving in the direction yeah. that we like. It happens that many times you start on one vision and you realize it's not the right direction and you switch courses and you rethink it and then take another tag. You, know, you have a palette of 3,000 ingredients. If you're creating for, a, let's say, an air care product and you want to be commercial about it, usually in the neighborhood of 25 to 35 ingredients. When you're designing for toiletry products, that palette goes up significantly. Okay, and when you're designing for um, fine fragrances, it's not unusual to have upwards of 70 or 80 individual materials in there. So we had a client that actually sent us pictures, and they were trying to create a fragrance that would best uh, invoke the essence of George Clooney or Cary Grant. We would discuss like what, a, what fragrance type would really personify a George Clooney type of man who was alluring, who was sophisticated, who you really wanted to get to know. Maybe like if it was an oceanic note, if it was something like that was cool or refreshing. The customer had an emotion that they wanted to convey, and we needed to make it into a, a tangible fragrance juice, if you will. Nancy has an idea, I have an idea, we take a look at it, and then we really start to brainstorm taking a piece of this fragrance and a piece of this fragrance. My job, in essence, is to be the uh, liaison between the cut, what the customer wants and um, what the perfumer wants, if you will, and to kind of coax out from the perfumer what the customer really needs from a project. Most perfumers are temperamental and moody, so she has to kind of work with, you know, the kind of attitude and kind of bring out what this project needs. So she's at times my muse, she's my master, and everything in between in order to extract, you know, that creative essence to satisfy the client. We asked Christoph how he would approach a fragrance designed to recall the Art Deco period of New York. First, I would think of a few elements that were very important at the time that could recreate the scent of the time. And I'm thinking about woods, but also metal. Eh? It's when a lot of great buildings were built. Uh, stones also was uh, very important. The fabric of the people, a lot of people were wearing hats. For me, it's very representative of those, of those periods. For the people, Art Deco, that was the modern thing, that was optimistic. So I would get this feeling also to have something uh, grand, inspiring. What ingredients, let's say, would I choose to uh, include in this uh, fragrance? It's like an obvious one is the patchouli, which is a, a very um, elegant wood, has a little bit of a mystical side to it, uh, represent also the, the mustiness, I think, at the time that uh, either the woods or the, the, the street had. Well, it turns out that carrot seed oil or absolute smells very nice of uh, like a very blonde wood, a very elegant wood. Same, I would use algae absolute, seaweed absolute. And why? Because it gives to the wood a little je ne sais quoi, a little sense of mystery, not because it smells of the sea. If you use just a little bit like a pinch of salt, it gives to the, the wood this, uh, this edge and also a little metallic effect. And a metallic effect that fits with wood. It's how you apply those ingredients to one another. Um, that's where the true creativity comes in. You, know? you have to each time to try to be actually more clever than the ingredients. And I'm sure it's like a musician. You have to, at the end, be more clever than the instrument. Or the painter, you have to be more clever than the brush and the color. Or like a chef, I'm sure they go the same way. I have my cinnamon, I have my, my woods, I have the smokiness. How can I be in them and how are they going to combine to have, to have this or not to have that? You take something that would really be used in a high concentration and use it in an extraordinary concentration, sometimes 20 or 30 times more than would traditionally be found in a fragrance. And in those areas, some of the most unique and beautiful fragrances in the world have been 
designed in that way. You're walking down the street, you're in a restaurant, and you smell a fragrance that you've created. How does that make you feel? I was in an, in an airport, in the Paris airport, and I saw a, a woman, a very uh, sophisticated, elegant woman with leather boots up to here, and a really unusual, unusually uh, glamorous, walking by with, uh, with my scent, with one of my scents. We entered the airplane, and for some reason, she was sitting right next to me, and I said, oh my God, God punished me to have made a fragrance so powerful. <laughs> now I'm gonna have eight hours. <laughs> but she was so excited about, it because eventually I told her that, you know, the fragrance you've been wearing is something I made. She was so excited about it. Like for eight hours, I heard about <laughs> how her husband loved it, how her children loved it. The fragrance industry directly employs about 7,000 people globally. But if you take the combination of all the consumer products that are touched and actually dependent on the technologies that fragrance brings, um, it rises into directly dependent jobs into the high hundreds of thousands. That one little fragrance is really, really important in providing jobs for people and opportunity for people. When we talk about sustainability, what is happening at the moment, perfumers and perfume houses are trying to cut the middlemen so that the farmers get more revenue on their crops. We also try to do contracts more and more that are long-term contracts, three years, five years, to guarantee a crop to a farmer. And this way, we protect well, the farmer, the village, and uh, we secure some productions, and this is what we call sustainability. You support families, you bring children to school in India thanks to some jasmine plantations, or you want the jasmine to be the best possible jasmine, so you help those villages to get water pumps. The industry is, is challenged by the lack of understanding of fragrance and perfumery. The industry is making an enormous effort to try to be safe for the consumers. The Research Institute for Fragrance Materials is main focus is looking at the safety of fragrance materials from the spectrum of human health use all the way to, through the environment, what happens to it when it gets into the environment. The Institute focuses on gathering all of the scientific literature on the material and um, evaluating all of the data through an independent uh, expert panel and then they provide guidance on how a material should be used and all of the standards are available on the on the web. Several years ago we published what we call our ingredient palette and that is a list of those materials that are in use commercially that are in any fragrance worldwide. I think it's unnecessary to ask an artist to provide his recipe for anyone to see. What I think is fair is for the industry to communicate to the public the raw materials that may have been used. We smell tons of things every day, every day, concentrated things, much more concentrated than anything that's on the market because we have access to the pure things. So, and I've never heard that a perfumer died losing his nose. We would know, we would know. It's been thousands of years that there has been uh, perfumers. And people have to know that the quantities you need to smell are tiny, tiny, tiny. Even when you smell something very pungent, you think there's a lot in the air or a lot on your skin. If you do the calculation, those quantities are so tiny, like negligible. And that's why we have a nose. It's to detect this thing before they become significant. Consumers should always feel that they, they can enjoy fragrances without any kind of concern. What would a world without fragrance be like? Oh, man. I think it would be very sad. <laughs> Black and white. Black and white, yes. I think a world without fragrance would be dull. The whole world just, you know, what, blah. It would be generic. Right. It's awful. It's an awful thing. No, it's hard for me because then I would take the happy part of things. So, 
Um, yeah, I'm sure you've you've walked down the street and had a a an experience where it brought you back to your childhood. Uh, I don't think there's a person I know that hasn't had that experience where they they don't even want the smelling, but they said, "Well, oh, it smells like." It smells like grandma. You can't identify the fragrance, but you identified the, the, the setting that you smell that. Those associations never ever leave your mind. It's just, it's, there's nothing else that I think I would ever want to do. I think this is like an art that, um, that I really love. I'd like to think that I excel at, and you never stop learning this craft, never. How do we create? How are we inspired? The same way as a musician is inspired, the same way as a painter is inspired, the same way as a chef is inspired. I think it has to make a deep impression on the person, either through memories or through the feelings that it evokes, make you uh, either connect with your, to something you loved or connect to your past or connect, you know, make you feel great or give you an exhilarating feeling. Or, you know, it has to have that kind of resonance. When you eat, smell. When you drink something, smell. When you uh, meet someone, we know, we smell the person. There are many things. The nose is also teaching you something. It's talking to you. It really does connect you to so much emotion, to so many different layers of, of life that it's just something that I couldn't imagine anyone really living without. It's really, um, that's why it's a sense of pride and emotion for, for me and for a lot of people. Thank you.